So uh, welcome again, everybody. And uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Emiliano Fiori. Emiliano is an associate professor of early Christian literature at Caposcari, University of Venice, and also is the principal investigator of the project FLOS, which is devoted to 8th, 9th century patristic uh, Florilegia in Syriac. Um, Emiliano graduated uh, from Padua with Professor Paolo Bettiolo and did a joint doctorate Bologna Paris with Professor Perrone and Professor uh, Hugo Narroche. Then he was a postdoc at Freie Universität uh, Amsterdam and then for six years at uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. His main research interests, as many of you know, uh, is the transfer of knowledge, uh, theological and philosophical knowledge from the Greek to the Syriac world, then uh, uh, Syriac ascetic mystical literature and Christian apocalypse. Uh, apocalypse. Um, this, uh, he has published widely on the topics and I'd like to mention only one of his uh, contribution to uh, scholarship, which is the edition of uh, the works of uh, Dionysus the Aropagite uh, in the version of Sergius of Reshaina. Uh, so, uh, Emiliano, the floor is yours. It's my great pleasure, and it would be a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you for your nice presentation, Valentina, and thank you all, Tetra team, for inviting me. Um, as, I, as I told you yesterday, I am um, very gl particularly glad to, to be given the occasion to um, the opportunity to present this. Um, interesting material I have recently I have recently discovered in, in a Syriac manuscript. It's the first time, so I'm eager to um, I'm looking forward to your suggestions and and to the discussion. So I think now I'm going to share my PowerPoint. If I have. Okay. Here we go. So let's go. Um, the Syriac manuscript, British Library 12th, additional 12155, is one of the so called Catene Patrum in Syriac of the British Library. So uh, they were called by William Wright, the cataloger of the collection. A thick manuscript of 268 leaves written on two columns. Description is the longest one in William Wright's catalog, covering 34 pages. Most probably, it dates to the ninth century, uh, differently from what uh, Wright uh, suggested. Uh, he suggested the eighth century. Um, and the volume consists of florilegia and authored works from the formative period of the Syriac Maiathicite church. Research into the content of the manuscript carried out by the Floss project team is allowing us to put forward the hypothesis concerning the overall strategy underlying the composition of the manuscript. Additional 12155 contains rare or unique documents for the intellectual history of Maya physicism. For example, documents related to the Christological controversy around Probus between 585 and 95, the only extant copy of an epistolary exchange between uh, the Maiathicites and the Chalcedonian monks of Mar Marun a unique document of the Christological controversies of the sixth century. It also contains a variety of anti-Julianist and anti-treatise documents and the short texts attributed to a certain Paul Bar Arab, which I'm going to discuss today. The manuscript then appears as a collection of documents on the origins of the Maiathicite church and concentrates on much the same period and controversies that were the focus of the first part of Dionysius of Telmachres Chronicle. To put it very briefly, the uniqueness of many of these documents suggests a, prov a provenance from the archives of the Syriac Maiathicite Patriarchate. Whereas the overlapping with uh, Dionysius of Telmachres Fauci of interest suggests that Dionysius himself may have been the direct or indirect inspirer of such a collection. Although the greatest part of the manuscript focuses on theological and ecclesiological matters, the last few sections switch ascetic and eschatological topics, which are treated in the form of a patristic plurilegium. For the eschatological part, the compiler accepted a passage from Epiphanius of Salamis's De Duodecim Gemis, the only known extant Syriac excerpt from this work, 
which deals with the interpretation of the burial gem and treats the topic of resurrection. In referring to this topic, Epiphanius origins arch enemy, as is well known during the so-called first originist controversy of the fourth century, adds a polemical note against the idea of an incorporeal resurrection, which he attributed to Origen and his followers. Then we find a series of excerpts from Chrysostom's homilies on Paul's epistles, and one in between Chrysostom's um, fragments, excerpts, from Cyril of Alexandria's commentary on Isaiah, which deals with the eternal punishment of the damned, thus addressing another typical anti-originist issue, the concept of apocatastasis. Epiphanius and Cyril, we may say, paved the way to our texts. Two short notes written by a certain Paul Bar Arab and addressed to one Theodosius, Duke of Callinicum, both hitherto unknown to late prosop antique prosopography. In the first heading, this Paul is said to have abandoned orthodoxy, that is, my physicism, but to have written these messages before falling into heresy. He was a man clearly a man of fine philosophical, literary, and theological education, as both texts illustrate, and so must have been his addressee in order to be able to decipher all the references to and to agree on the authority of the cited sources. Since the addressee, being a duke, is a prominent figure of the society of Callinicum, the author can then hardly be anyone but another layman or rank of rank or a churchman. I have long been at a loss to figure out who this Paul may be, even fencing may have been, even fencing that he may have been one of the main Maiaphysite Paul who had some relationship with Callinicum in the sixth century, the Bishop Paul of Callinicum who translated Severus of Antioch's anti-Julianist works in the 520s. But it would have been strange to, um, to uh, learn from this title that he, fell from, from, from a physicism at a, at a certain point. But the solution is simpler and Severus of Antioch does anyway have something to do with it. In fact, in his edition of Severus's letters, in his editions of Severus's letters, Brooks overlooked some items. This is, this is already known, of course. One of these Cinderella's is a lengthy letter on the incomprehensibility of the incarnation uh, that Severus addressed to a nobleman, Barhire of Callinicum, a certain Arab. This Arab must be the father of our Paul, I guess. If this is true, we can at least be sure that Paul, regardless of whether he was a churchman, belonged to the same social rank of his interlocutor. So now let us first read the main body of the texts uh, and then we'll comment upon them. First one, Agnosticon, Theodosius, the Duke of Callinicum, made by Paul Bar Arab before he fell into heresy. My Lord, it has thus been proved, this wording may suggest that we are reading an excerpt. It has thus been proved that concerning the same words of Empedocles, Alexander of Aphrodisias says transmigration of souls, whereas Saint Gregory says transmigration of bodies. They recognize that there is no difference at all between transmigration of souls and transmigration of bodies. And your authority will also consider another point, namely that from the same citation of St. Gregory, we learn what I was saying in the evening. That is that for him who says that the souls are prior to the bodies, it is necessary to say transmigration of souls. And believe me, my Lord, that from now on, I'm not going to display anything of my own but I shall repeat the teachings of the saintly fathers and of the teachers. Alexander of Aphrodisias from the commentary on the first book of Aristotle's The Anima. He, we may suppose he's referring to Aristotle, then missing verb. He, uh -uh, the discourse concerning the transmigration of souls by saying that indeed, since it is invented the discourse as a myth by Pythagoras, what it says is not, nor is there anything in it, worth discussing, as isn't the passage of Empedocles. Behold, sometimes there was a boy and a girl, a tree and a bird, and a fish in the sea, things that are absurd. And a little further, he, probably Aristotle, made his Empedocles' doctrine, doctrines on the transmigration of souls, depend on Pythagoras, since Pythagoras was its source and he especially made use of it. That's my tentative translation. 
here comes a citation against the pre-existence and the transmigration of souls from the 28th chapter of Gregory of Nyssa's The Omni Superficial. Then Paul goes on to say, it is necessary, my Lord, that we adduce three true witnesses according to the commandment of the Holy Scripture, to the fact that the doctrine of the priority of souls is abhorred and blamed by Christians. We have then St. Gregory with the words that are written above, the citation from Gregory of Nyssa. Take also the wise Cyril. And here comes a passage from Cyril's commentary on John 1, 9, against the pre-existence of the soul, immediately followed by a passage of Gregory Nazianzen's oration 37 on the same topic. Then the text abruptly ends with this citation and we pass to the following one. Another prognosticon to the same Duke, Theodosius. Since before your departure, my Lord, we often discussed about origin, about whom some saintly and wise men affirmed that he resembled the land of Egypt because of what Homer said. It is the Egyptian land which brings many herbs. The ground gave good life, even though mixed with many evils. And since for this thing, a clear sighted soul is required, which is able to discern good from evil things and things divine from things demonic or human, especially when the divine word is at stake, as Athena says to Diomedes, lo, I have dispersed the darkness from your eyes, the darkness by which you were blinded, so that you may know God and man exactly. Therefore, so after all these sins, sins, that's the main clause, it is indispensable, my Lord, that as far as it is possible, we recognize Circe's corrupting schemes and that, we, and that we are not attracted by the seductions of the pleasant voices of the sirens, for such was that man origin. Take then this good herb, and enter Circe's room only if holding it, and its power will save you from the day of evil. Indeed, if we read the works of that man with discernment, we will bloom like a rose and we abstain and escape from the thorns. Take notice then, O commander of peoples, since once again Homeric characters were used on your account. If you can approve the few teachings from that man that I shall point you to, leaving aside many teachings of that man of origin. Um, both texts are very dense, so I can only try to give some hints at a larger picture. Uh, the original language of the two uh, notes must have been Greek. But the quotation from Alexander of Aphrodisias in the first text, even more than those from Homer in the second, the allusive style pointing to a shared familiarity with Greek elite paideia, all point to an original Greek text. The two texts look like, like letters, but lack two crucial, crucial elements of epistolography, the initial and final, final greetings, which may be due to their being excerpts, of course. However, they are conceived as Zentschreiben in the way of short informative messages that presuppose and replace the oral exchange. In the second note, Paul Bar Arab refers to discussions held with Theodosius, Theodosius before the latter's departure. But both writings are called prognosticon, moreover. This term usually recurs in medicine, having its roots in Hippocrates' treatise with the same name. It is also used in magic, astronomy, and agriculture, always referring to the foreknowledge of phenomena. However, Paul's messages to Theodosius are rather intended as a precautional means to prevent the addressee from falling into a pathological fascination for origins most dangerous doctrines, because the future development of a fascination for some of origins teaching would certainly, this is implied, be the disease of heresy. We may then translate the term prognosticon not as way of foreknowing, but as preventive writing. The only trace of a similar use of the term in Greek is a passage, Galen's The Antidotis, the Antidotis where he describes an antidote called prognostice antidotos, in the sense of preventive antidote. Indeed, he writes, Galen writes, if those who drink it in advance assume a poison thereafter, they will immediately vomit it together with the food. On the contrary, who does not ingest anything strange or harmful together with the victuals given to him will not have nausea and will retain the food. This seems precisely the sense in which the prognostic power of Paul Bar Arab's warnings should act on Theodosius. 
If he's ad adequately, adequately prepared and meets one of Origen's harmful teachings, he will reject it, he will vomit them, but he will retain whatever is good. Now, coherent with the epoch, the epoch of the author, who was the son of an addressee of Severus, very likely, these prognostica betray an attitude towards origin that is typical of the mid sixth century. The question of pre-existence in particular to which the first text is entirely devoted was key in the originist controversy of the Justinianic era. For indeed, what are the, these pernicious teachings against which Paul warns his interlocutor? In the first prognosticon, the polemical goal is clearly the pre-existence of the soul. This is already adumbrated in the few initial lines that introduce the quotation from Alexander. It is indifferent, Paul writes, whether one says transmigration of bodies or transmigration of souls. Both conceptions presuppose that the soul existed before uh, entering a body. It was commonly assumed that Origen and his later followers had espoused such a belief. This assumption, as I said, was a central accusation against the Originists during the second controversy in the first half of the sixth century. In the fourth century, Gregory of Nyssa and Epiphanius had already paid attention to this question. The 28th chapter of Gregory of Nyssa's The Omni Opificio, quoted by Paul, was addressed against the pre-existence and the transmigration of souls, and became an obliged reference for anti-originist polemic in the sixth century, when pre-existence and apocatastasis crystallized as the core topics around which the whole polemic turned. The tone was set by Emperor Justinian in his letter to Menas of 543, in which he quoted large passages from the Hominis Opificio 28. The other two quotations selected by Paul Bar Arab from Gregory Nazianzen's Oration 37 and from Cyril of Alexandria, uh, his commentary on John, seem to be unique to him, at least for, for us, to, for our knowledge of the sources, driven as they are by Paul's intention to match the scriptural prescription on the three true witnesses. The really unique feature of Paul's note, however, is not so much the use of new patristic quotations as the fact that he widens, broadens his repertoire to include a pagan reference. This quotation from Alexander of Aphrodisius highlights the familiarity of both interlocutors with classical culture. Empedocles, Pythagoras, and Alexander of Aphrodisias are spontaneously part of the discussion, their relevance being simply implied. Surprisingly enough, however, this citation was not detected by scholars of ancient philosophy, although it is remarkable as it comes from a lost work of Alexander, the commentary of Aristotle's De Anima. It is then a hitherto, a hitherto unknown fragment from the philosopher. Unfortunately, the passage in additional 12155 is short and what is worse, the part of the page where the citation is placed is partially ruined by a water stain, as you can see here from the whole page in a detail. Luckily, this passage of Alexander is tacitly, tacitly quoted by John Philoponus in his commentary on the, uh, the anima, based on which we can approximately reconstruct its wording and meaning. In this quotation, Alexander cites Empedocles' famous verses on reincarnation from the Katarmoi, which we thus can read in Syriac translation, and rejects their content as absurd. Now, Paul does provide a sort of programmatic justification for the use of the philosopher when he announces that he will quote from the fathers and the teachers, uh, implied the pagan teachers. The by he evidently, evidently shows that he conceives of both sources the fathers and the teachers as of legitimate authorities, although hierarchically not on the same level. This is surprising for whereas the patristic argument as a method in dogmatic polemics had become common in the sixth century and Justinian's anti-originist letter is there to confirm it, the use of pagan authorities was contrary to the intellectual atmosphere that the emperor had established. Although the scholastic style of the most speculative authors of this time presupposed the fine preparation in philosophy, let us think of John Philoponus or Leontius of Byzantium, in a time of cultural wars, so to say, the argument based on earlier authorities was strictly limited to scripture and the fathers. In the domain of the originist controversy in particular, supporting one's arguments with quotations from pagan authors is an unparalleled practice. 
we cannot exclude that Paul was a free spirit who desired to put a large erudition to profit without imposing restrictions on the advantages he could draw from it. But at the same time, we must consider the peculiar character of his exchange with Theodosius. Paul is not engaging in a formal heresiological dispute, but is giving learned advice to a cultivated layman in private form. The choice to close the text with three patristic quotations, however, and the reference to the biblical rule of the three true witnesses indicates that the fathers are regarded as, regarded as the crowning authorities without whom the argument would be incomplete. The second note, which on the contrary does not display patristic quotations, tries to convince Theodosius that origin must not be rejected straight away, but read in discernment. We can find a similar exhortation to distinguish between what is dangerous and what is harmless, not in origin, but in Evagrius, within the context of a discussion of origin's controversial heritage in mid sixth century Palestine, where John of Gaza, the monastic fellow of Barsanufius, gives similar recommendations to his addressee. Do not accept, I quote, such doctrines, but read of him, of Evagrius, if you wish, what is useful for the soul, following the evangelical parable of the net. They have put the good fishes in vessels and threw away the rotten ones. What John of Gaza does with the evangelical parable in relation to Evagrius in a strictly monastic context is not so distant from what Paul Bar Arab does with Homer in relation to origin in his urban setting. One has to accept both say, John and Paul, what is healthy for the soul and reject the rest. The unique peculiarity of our prognosticon, however, is that these arguments are voiced through a mosaic of allusions and citations from Homer. Paul quotes two couples of Homeric verses, literally one from each poem, and then alludes to two further episodes of the Odyssey. Circe's sorcery with Odysseus resistance, thanks to the herb Molly and the sirens. This patchwork of Homeric texts and motives is interesting for at least two reasons. The first obvious one is that we are offered the opportunity to read some more Homeric verses in Syriac translation, almost certainly directly translated from the Greek of the prognosticon itself. The second reason of interest is that nowhere else in any extant Christian source, Homer is used as part of anti-originist discourse. This makes Paul's second prognosticon a groundbreaking source for the history of originism overall. This uniqueness is again probably due to the specific nature of the interlocutor, because Paul explicitly draws Theodosius' attention on, to the fact that Homer is used for him. Homeric characters were used on your account as a pedagogical device, as it were, applied uh, to someone who being a layman of educated, of elevated education was more at ease with Homer than with theology. On the other hand, however, Quotations and allusions reproduce consolidated traditional motives of the Christianization of Homer in late antiquity, especially the references to Circe and Sirens, whose moral value in Christian Greek literature was investigated in classics of scholarship, such as Hugoraners, the Griechische Mythen in Christlicher Deutung of 1957, and Robert Lamberton's actually more devoted to pagan sources, Homer, the Theologian of 1986. I cannot elaborate on each of these motives, but it is worth giving some details on the quotations of the quotation from Iliad 5, where Homer writes that Athena lifts the mist from Diomedes' eyes. His ver this verse was present in Pagan as well as in Christian authors well before the sixth century CE as an allegory of the purification of the inner eye to make it ready for divine illumination. This line of interpretation emerges in Plato's Alcibiades II, followed by Plotinus, Porphyry, and Proclus. That in Paul Bar Arab's times, the two verses were interpreted as a sign of spiritual purification and illumination is clear from a passage of, a con of the contemporary Alexandrian philosopher Olympiodorus, who in his commentary on Plato's Phaedo writes, the poets say that sense perception yields no accurate knowledge. Homer too says about Diomedes, she took the mist away that had clouded his eyes that he might clearly know. For if he had not met Athena, he would have not have seen anything clearly. Allusions to this verse are especially frequent between the middle of the fifth and the sixth century 
mm, this will not be a chance in Nonus of Panopolis' paraphrase of the Gospel of John, Theodoret of Cyrus' Cricarum Affectionum Curatio, Ammonius' commentary on Aristotle's categories, and Dionysius the Rapagite's divine names. In our short prognosticon, all this history is spontaneously implied, which presupposes that Paul and Theodosius shared this world of implications. Paul Bararab's use of these citations and motives then presupposes a complex intellectual strategy expressed in the confidential use of a keyboard of Homeric harmonics that is equally familiar to him and his reader. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emiliano, for this fascinating discovery and for this rich paper. We open now the floor for discussion. If you have a question, you can either write it in the chat or raise your electronic hand and we'll, uh, we'll give you the word. Um, I see Mara already has the first question. Yeah, it's, it's more of a very quick comment. Uh, thank you, Emiliano. This was fantastic. Uh, one quick question. I seem to remember that Homer Odyssey is translated in Syriac. Well, it's quoted in Syriac only in Michael the Great. So this would be the first uh, quotation from the Odyssey. Because, well, for Heliod, we have more, uh, well, more instances. But Odyssey, I seem to remember it's not there, actually. So yeah. this is quite striking. This yes, would be yes. the first. It's it's right. uh, it's it's striking indeed. Um, uh, the Odyssey was not translated into Syriac apparently, right? Theophilus of Edessa uh, is credited with the translation of the Iliad in the eighth century, and uh, we cannot say um, that that's an interesting thing to add. We cannot say whether the, the quotation from the Iliad comes from Theophilus or was revised. I suspect it was translated directly from the Greek of the original mm -hmm. prognosticon. It may have been revised uh, uh, through Theophilus, but we do not have this verse, this specific couple of verses from Iliad 5 in Theophilus's version. So we cannot say. Whereas Odyssey is really the first or second, you, you, I, I didn't know about uh, the, the quotation in Michael the Great, but uh, it's one of the really, uh, of the rare, uh, if not the only, uh, now uh, I see, quotation from the Odyssey in Syriac. Uh, uh, and he's saying that the quotation yes. in Michael comes from, oh, okay, yeah, I remember yes. Michael, but not that part. But also I wanted to add, if I can use a couple more minutes, that this, this usage of both the Greek past and the Christian, well, past and present is something that in the ninth century is, is extant as well in Antony to Greek. So this is something that was uh, circulating. Thank you, uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I might jump in, if I don't see any other question, I was also fascinated by the quotation that you show of uh, Alexander, of, uh, of Aphrodite, and the fact that it's, uh, it's a bit corrupted in the manuscript. So you said that it's there's a parallel in John Philoponus, but yes, is the, yes, that, that's more? quite surprising because I I, um, I was uh, just just a couple of days before talking, uh, so a couple of days ago uh, I was uh, in despair and uh, trying to 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 make something out of this uh, quotation that I really couldn't read uh, in the in even, uh, also autoptically I, I saw it uh, in London but uh, it's really it's really impossible to 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 make something reasonable out of that quotation. And so I, I tried to, to just to insert, it, it was quite obvious actually, the Greek of Empedocles in, in, in the Tesau, in the TLG. And it came out that Philoponus, uh, in John Philoponus in his commentary on the anima, uh, is saying something about this, uh, this quotation, Empedoclean quotation, which is exactly uh, I could I could deduce identical to what uh, Alexander of Aphrodisia is saying in this quotation, because at any rate, you can read half of it. There is a, the, the, the left part of the column is readable. So I, I, I had an idea of what Alexander was saying, and it was certainly what also Philoponus was saying. But Philoponus is not uh, quoting Alexander explicitly. So the interesting thing is that we can reconstruct, uh, through Philoponus, we can reconstruct Alexander's quotation, Alexander's quotation, more or, le more or, le more or less the, 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 the wording or the sense at least. And we can attribute uh, and the, 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 the Philoponian discourse on Empedocles to Alexander uh, 
since uh, Philoponus doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't mention him directly. So we have a double gain from this, uh, and it was quite surprising. Thank you. Thank you very much. Giovanni Madalino, please. Thank you, Emiliano, for, uh, for your uh, presentation. I just uh, wanted to ask about the details since you uh, were discussing Alexander's quotation. And uh, I was wondering, it, it is usually uh, thought <clears throat> that um, Alexander's uh, commentary on the anime is lost, but Alexander's book called On Soul uh, preserves the main contents. And it was uh, something like a working of uh, the lost commentary. So, Mm, I don't know whether you have checked that for traces of this uh, quotation or not, but just in case I, I wanted to point it out. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, um, for pointing this out. Yes, of course, uh, but I, but I, the, the, this uh, doxographical part, so to say, is not particularly... Um, has, has no particular place, uh, particular... <laughs> Pride of place, so to say, in uh, in the uh, in in this epitome, sort of epitome, we can suppose of Alexander of his own commentary. So that that was I, that's why I was in despair, <laughs> and uh, I was looking to to for 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 traces of 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 this passage elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, indeed, Valentina. Yes, uh, thanks again, Emiliano, for um, this talk. I have a question about the patristic quotations that uh, you mentioned. So uh, are these quotations like normally quoted within an anti-originist context or it's like something original of Paul? Can you tell something more about this maybe? Yeah, as, as I said, um, Gregory of, of Nyssa's um, yeah. chapter 28 from the Omnis Opificio is absolutely... Um, a must, so to say, it's a it's a whole chapter against the the transmigration of souls and the pre-existence of souls. So, it's uh, largely quoted abundantly, lavishly, I would say, quoted by by Justinian, and so it, it seems to have been a, an obliged reference uh, in uh, during the second Origins controversy. Whereas Cyril and Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, Oration Thirty Seven, are um, to the current state of our knowledge. Um, unique to to uh, to Paul but the interesting thing is that in later Florilegia there is an the, the, the same manuscript 12155 and other manuscripts preserve an interesting anti-originist Florilegium which uh, goes always together in the, the Christological and anti-Julianist and anti-treatist Florilegium and the in this in this uh, Florilegium a whole chapter is made up of these three citations together with one more citation from Irenaeus. So um, th this is uh, particularly interesting and drawing from this Florilegia, I think, uh, drawing them from this Florilegium, um, John of Dara in his book on soul, on the soul, also aligns these three quotations from uh, Gregory of Nyssa, 28th chapter of the Ominous Pificio, Cyril of Alexandria on John, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, Oration 37, he also. So this uh, group of citations is new in Paul in the sixth century, so to say, uh, but it has a tradition then, a later tradition in Syriac. I see, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have Lorenzo Perone first and David Taylor afterwards. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emiliano, for your paper and your presentation was so fascinating. I have two questions. The first one concerns this term prognosticos, uh, prognosticon. Uh, I don't uh, uh, remember whether you spoke about also your status of Antioch uh, critique of uh, origin. Uh, he has a diagnosticon. Mm. Mm -hmm. Diagnosticos. Yes, yes. I wonder whether this uh, formulation, prognosticos, uh, reveals a different attitude in a way more positive towards origin than mm. it was the case with yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
since the use is rather rare, could uh, Paul have known also this uh, uh, text? Uh, the second question is uh, uh, concerning the context of this dispute, since there is uh, uh, more openness towards origin, uh, the use of origin. Of course, this is a criterion uh, that one can find also in uh, uh, fiery uh, enemies of origin as uh, Jerome. For Jerome, instance. yes. But, uh, uh, but uh, no, for the Syriac uh, context of this same period, the uh, 6th uh, century, there is uh, the life of uh, of Simeon, uh, uh, of Emesa, there is a famous uh, uh, dispute, a discussion between two monks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that this option was more uh, frequent than we know. Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, you should also consider this uh, witness uh, in uh, the life of Simeon uh, Salos. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Actually, yes, uh, Eustatius was part originally part of this paper, but I couldn't uh, at all. There, there really wasn't time, and I had to to just to drop half a page where I um, discussed it uh, together with the, with the Galen, because I think that that the medical uh, the, the medical reference is absolutely there, but uh, there must be um, in the background some reference to. Uh, Eustatius's Diagnosticos Logos against origin, origins interpretation of the belly meter or mitre uh, of 1 Samuel 10, 28. Um, so, and uh, Diagnosticos was perhaps also, the, the medical reference was perhaps uh, present to, in, intended by, meant by Eustatius too, since Diagnosticos is also a medical, a prominently medical term. Um, and I think that both references are uh, behind the, the, the prognosticon in the medical sense and the diagnosticos in both the medical and eustatian sense are in the background of uh, this um, title of Paul Bar Arab's um, messages to Theodosius. And um, the difference, the relevant difference, as you, as you already pointed out, as you've already pointed out, is that uh, Eustatius is attitude was completely destructive, his analysis was destructive, whereas uh, Paul Bararabs is more, uh, is relatively more constructive than Eustatius was. And I think that the difference is especially chronological with Eustatius, we are at the very beginning of criticism against origin and uh, in, in, uh, in, in the middle of the sixth century, perhaps origin had to be uh, defended from, from 150 years of criticism that Eustatius had more or less kicked off in, at the beginning of the fourth. And the second reference, of course, is uh, will we'll come up in the article I'm writing on, on this, um, on, on, on this uh, text because uh, I, I'm trying to um, collect all the all possible references and Jerome is also, uh, although it, it, it belongs to another age, uh, is also one of them, all possible references to a positive attitude or to put it better to a distinction between what is good and what is bad in origin and the uh, dispute between two monks in the uh, Leontius of Neapolis is definitely one of them and one of the most important actually because we are with that dispute in just in the Juntus Justinianic era very likely so thank you for putting them for highlighting them and, and bringing them up Lorenzo thank you thank you indeed David Taylor Hi, Emiliana. Thank you so much for that. That, that was absolutely fascinating. C can I ask two, two very broad questions? And they're, they're, both, um, they're both based on sort of ignorance. Early on, you slipped in the idea uh, at the very beginning that 12155, this floral legion, uh, was potentially inspired by uh, Dionysius of Tel mm -hmm. Do you actually have any evidence for that? Or is that just because uh, they happen to possibly be at the same time? I mean, you know, in a sense, if they're contemporaries, one would expect something. So that, that's the first broad question is whether that's just sewn out there because it's a name or, or whether you actually really believe it. And the second question is out of real ignorance and, and, and self-serving. And, and that is um, how widespread was the idea of the pre-existence of the soul 
um, in this period or, or, or in the Christian texts that you've been working with or the Syriac texts? And I, I asked just because I don't know the answer to that question. This isn't a loaded question. And it's because yesterday evening, by chance, I was reading Jacob of Odessa's uh, uh, Hexamen. And he's having a long argument about the pre-existence of the soul in that context and, and linking it all to the, the idea that psyche, psyche is linked to the kind of the Greek verb for being cold, which you know implies that they yeah. come from a cold yeah. place and all that. So, so, so it really is it's a question of ignorance. It's just whether or not any of the main Christian parties were doing this. Thanks. OK, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, uh, as to the first question, uh, it's uh, my um, deep persuasion, but it's just a speculation, of course. Um, I, I, I don't have any evidence, but uh, the, I'm just crossing um, to crossing uh, different different elements. Uh, it's a recent hypothesis I, I came up with, and it, I, I don't pretend at all that it's uh, that it stands. Uh, but um, but still, I'm I'm, I'm feeling like putting it forward because uh, I'm crossing the the, um, the the date of the of the manuscript which is ninth century very it's very likely to be ninth century and the kind of documents it's really seems like a, a archival um, an excavation the result of an excavation in the arc in the patriarchal archives to which to which Dionysius refers uh, explicitly, so um, they are so unique, so um, it's such a rich documentation. It really seems like uh, the documents that uh, history could rely, uh, the, the, the writing of a history could rely upon, uh, as in Pseudo Zachariah, who uh, besides narrating the events, also brings up all these documents, letters, synodal letters, uh, Christological. Um, Ipomnemata or whatever. So it mm. really seems like a, like a collection that was prepared for someone who um, to create to create a separate archive for someone who had to um, rely upon it uh, in order to write history or to uh, to prepare for for Christological. Well, um, it's really a speculation. As I say, uh, there is no smoking gun for it, uh, and I think there there will there won't be any. But um, still, I am not. Um, I have come, I have come to a point uh, not to be shy anymore to to voice it. <laughs> I'd like to see that paper when you write it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, as to the second question, I'm ignorant too. I must confess. Um, uh, I well, the first thing is that this is not a Syriac document. We, we shouldn't consider it a Syriac topic and document. It's a, it's a Greek document and it's referring to a Greek controversy. Um, and so I, I, I cannot uh, say how, I, I really don't have an, any idea uh, about when it could have been translated into Syriac, uh, maybe quite early, but um, if this refers, if this has any impact on the real, um, Diffusion of a of a, of a doctrine of pre-existence of the souls in Syriac, I cannot really say, and um, and I, I can if you uh, if the, if the um, chair uh, authorizes me, I may um, chain this uh, this um, reply to Matteo Pogliani's question in in the in the chat. Sure. Uh, there there is of course evidence of uh, the diffusion of of originist doctrines, not of origin himself. As we know, origin wasn't translated into Syriac except for some small chunks, exegetical chunks on the Psalms. And, uh, but there was, of course, originism in Syriac. And the main representative in the sixth century who wrote and directly in Syriac was certainly Stephen Barsudaili. Uh, with his, probably his, or at least uh, part of it is due to him, uh, Book of the Holy Hierotius. So yes, the sixth century is also uh, an, ep an epoch of, of or, um, Syriac originism. Although, coming that, back to David, uh, uh, the pre-existence of soul, I don't know, it's, it's not there in the, in the, um, in the, the book of Irotius doesn't speak explicitly of the pre-existence of soul. So uh, I wouldn't really, wouldn't know what to, <laughs> what to reply here. Thank you, thank you. Do you want to add anything else? 
Who? <laughs> Me or two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so no, no, I was just spoken. saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, then we have Sebastian Brock. Oh, you are muted, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emiliano. That's wonderful. I was wondering how the Homeric quotations were translated, uh, whether competent or not. It says something for the translator if they were well done, because uh, I forget where it is. There's another translator who says it's left out the next quotation because it's too difficult. The Greek is, is too weird. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. That's really, that's really um, something that um, Few few Syriacs could do right. Uh, either in, I, I yes, that could point to an early translation. Uh, I mean, early in sixth century. So someone who really uh, shared in that um, be linguistic, uh, theological, and cultural koine uh, of, of sixth century Syrian Mesopotamia, rather than um, an, well. But still, since in the eighth century, there was a Theophilus of Edessa who was uh, able to do it. And in the, at the beginning of the ninth, there was a Theodosius of Edessa who could translate uh, the, the poems of Gregory of Nazianzus. I couldn't exclude that someone perhaps in Kenneshre was still able in the ninth, in the eighth and ninth century to translate this document. Mm. Yes, but that's def definitely uh, something that requires a high level of of education um, as you could per perhaps achieve in Canada Fair or otherwise uh, being also Greek speaking like in the sixth century. Mm, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sebastian. Thank you very much. Adrian Pirtea. Um, hi, Emiliano. Thank you for this really, really exciting paper and discovery. I just have a small comment or question. If uh, you've tried to look at the sixth century commentaries on the Fido, because you have Olympiodorus and Damascus. And I think it's quite interesting that you have this uh, renewed interest in uh, the arguments of Plato in the Fido about the immortality and the pre-existence of the soul. So you have two extant commentaries. And if you accept the sixth century dating for Nemesius, uh, then you have also a sort of Christian reception of the Fido there. So have you looked at this connection? Is it? No, not to... yet, not yet. Actually, um, I was just at the beginning with the with my Olympiodorus there, but actually, uh, you may you may uh, be right that the um, this um, concern with the, this being concerned with pre-existence uh, besides uh, origin, uh, originism, uh, so to say, may have something to do with the. I, I called it cultural wars that were uh, ongoing at the beginning of the sixth century between. Egypt and Palestine and Syria. Um, I, I, I find the, the reference to the sirens, for example, in the, I, I could, uh, I, I should elaborate a bit on this in, in, the, in the second prognosticon, very telling in this sense, because the sirens usually in the Christian tradition since um, Clement of Alexandria uh, were a symbol of pagan science or heresy, both. So uh, it's a sort of synthetic symbol that, um, because Homer himself said that uh, the, the sirens know everything, well, everything that happens on, on the earth. So um, they soon became um, a symbol of omniscience. And from Clement on, uh, they became the symbol of both in uh, already in Clement, uh, pagan science and pagan wisdom and science and heresy. Both uh, are seducing, uh, dangerous, and one has to be to have the energy and um, strength of an Odysseus to uh, pass by them without being seduced, right? To, to have this calm of, 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 this, of the spirit that can use the, the pagan wisdom without, without being seduced and corrupted by it. So um, it, it seems that what, uh, what Paul Bar-Arab has in mind here is that um, the danger of reading, of being uh, captivated by origin is uh, both the danger of being captivated by an excessive and exceeding uh, application of pagan doctrines to Christianity that also implies heresy. It's something that is typical of, of this sixth century, early sixth century cultural wars. Yes. 
but thank you. I, I will, I will um, look at Fado's commentary quite more attentively. I mean, just, just to add, because if you have, I mean, you have shown that uh, both the interlocutors were very well versed in uh, late antique uh, Neoplatonic commentaries. So it, one may even imagine, of course, we couldn't have any proof for this, but we could imagine that they were schooled or had access to the Alexandrian tradition. And that's yeah. where the, the Fido was commented upon and was uh, really. Uh, that's well that's received, quite likely. So, that's yeah. quite likely since since he he's he's quoting Paul is quoting Alexander, uh, and also John Philoponus in his time in Paul's time is quoting Alexander the same passage from Alexander. That seems to really seems to be something that circulated in the school uh, there. And moreover, uh, as you may know, John Philoponus's commentary on the Anima is uh, said to be is considered to be apophones of Ammonius. So it's really something that was taught at the school. Apparently, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I do have a small question, also a general one, um, about the date of the manuscript, because you suggested it's <laughs> more of a ninth century, either because of the connection you see with Dionysius of the Mahre, or can you, can you let us know something well, more? Okay, uh, well, in a, in a sense, um, on the one hand, I, I would tend to attribute the, the script of the manuscript rather to the ninth uh, than to the eighth century, to the early eighth century, rather early eighth century, because uh, Wright suggested that we have to date it to the to 747. Because uh, at the very end of the manuscript, there is a colophon, um, an erased, uh, carefully erased colophon, saying in the year of Alexander uh, uh, 58. But this uh, 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 is, uh, was, uh, according to Wright, was 1,000, but why? <laughs> we, we really don't need to, to, to assume that. Uh, it can be uh, later than that. It, can, it could be 847. I, I um, would rather tend to, to, to take this as a... As a and when, and we, we don't even know whether it refers to when the manuscript was written. It may have uh, been, it may refer to an acquisition, it may be an acquisition note. Um, but still, I would have some doubt about 747. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. But I'm, I am, um, I am, uh, I'm happy to be contradicted on this, of course. Huh? Um, I'm sure that if anybody has any other remarks, they will point it out. But for I'm the calling moment... for contradiction, please. <laughs> for the moment, Teresia Lavrinovita, please. Uh, hello, thank you very much, Emiliano, for your hello. very interesting presentation. I am uh, totally not a patristical um, person, but uh, uh, maybe you can uh, uh, help me to understand a little bit uh, more about hermeneutical function. So uh, I, I have been uh, interested a little bit in origin and Homer, and uh, I just want to ask you your, your personal opinion. Uh, when the person is using the quotation or refers to Homer, which is um, uh, quite uh, distant in time. Of course, that's the same sc uh, school, you can say, or philosophical continuation. Uh, would that mean that um, there is also hermeneutical, in a way, uh, hermeneutical um, uh, area, common hermeneutical area where these uh, thinkers operate? And uh, yeah. Is there any mechanism how how these uh, allusions and quotations are viewed? Whether there is con we can we can say there is Homer is still um, influential in hermeneutical thought. Okay, um, if I understand you well, uh, there is uh, first of all um, a, 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 an element of education to be considered. So. Uh, High, um, high rank, so to say, elite Christians. 
we're in the sixth century, in the, the, the whole first half of the sixth century, and even later, were still educated uh, in traditional schools where they, uh, grammatical and rhetorical schools, where they learned Homer by heart as young people already. Uh, and so Homer was, so to say, their um, inner patrimony, uh, cultural patrimony. And um, on the other hand, uh, they are the inheritors of a long, very long tradition of hermeneutics on the, um, well, on the Homeric texts that was uh, developed by the Stoics and then by Middle and Neoplatonists uh, that read Homer allegorically. And this kind of reading was, so to say, transferred by Christians along, along the centuries, of course, uh, to, um, to, the, to, to the scriptures. So um, the fact of referring to Homer uh, for exe exegetical purposes uh, was uh, sort of uh, uh, going back to the, to, the, to the origins of the history of hermeneutics, of uh, late antique hermeneutics in a sense. And um, Homer was used uh, more often than we, than we usually think. For example, Origen himself, which is curious, used Homer uh, in his polemics against Celsus, of, for apologetic reasons, of course, because Celsus was a pagan philosopher, so uh, using pagan sources against him was considered by, by Origen as particularly effective. So sometimes he retorted Homer against Celsus in his Contra Celsum of the third century. And it's quite curious to see that now Paul Bararab is used Homer somehow against origin. So it's, uh, it's um, a sort of interplay, a historical interplay along the centuries. Also Gnostics used, oh, hi Alberto. <laughs> also Gnostics used Homer, of course. Um, the curious things, uh, thing, for example, Alberto, is that um, the, uh, the, 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 the molly, the, the idea of the, of the magical herb that helps Odysseus against against um, Circe and the idea of the sirens uh, as uh, heresy were both um, used against the Gnostics and the, uh, by, by Clement of Alexandria, by Origen in the case of the, of the, of, uh, of the herb, the molly against Circe, which is curious because uh, in, in this letter, um, the two references are used against Origen, so to say, who was in, himself, in his turn against, uh, wrote against the Gnostics. So um, we really see that the same hermeneutical tools are uh, reused in favor or against an opinion uh, in history according to the opportunity of the moment in a way. But I, with this, I don't know whether I have replied to your question because it, it presupposes- Thank you, absolutely. No, thank you, absolutely. <laughs> okay, sorry. <Thanks. laughs> and we have another connected question in the, in the chat. And if you wanna ask, read it yourself or ask it yourself, please feel free to do so. Oh, yes. Other... Yes, David, of course, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, so Homer, Taylor said that mosaic. Homer was also recently seen in mosaic with the Syriac labels and uh, yeah, yeah, basically you answer the question, do we have references for Dachi? Because uh, the question was, does Homer appear in the pavement of some churches in Jordan next to Okeanos, Aphrodites and other pagan figures? And that David Taylor replied, Homer was also recently seen in mosaic with Syriac uh, sorry, I lost it. So your labels, and then do we have any reference for that? Yes. Okay, we'll wait for that. Meanwhile, <laughs> we wait for that. I see we have another yeah, we question have to, from the bibliographical entry. Yes. We'll uh, Rafael Tundini. Meanwhile, uh, while we wait, what reference? Yes, just a little hint. Uh, um, in the beginning of the second letter, so origin is compared with the land of Egypt, and this is. Yeah. Uh, um, reinforced by the quotation from uh, Homer. Uh, can we take this as a sort of rewrite and rethink and reshaping 
of uh, origin self interpretation of the treasures of the Egyptians in the exode as the pagan culture and science. So Homer as a treasure of the Egyptian and the origin as a part of this pagan heretic science that can mm -hmm. that should be taken with care. Yeah, that's a very fine idea. I think, yes, you're, you're fully right. And it's a very uh, fine idea. Um, I had some, uh, some first impression on this, but uh, I must confess that the second, um, the, the, this, this first quotation um, is, uh, I am a bit, a bit at a loss to understand this, uh, this first quotation from, from Homer, from the Odyssey. Because it seems to be to really be, it doesn't have a tradition that they could track uh, back to any to any author. Um, so there doesn't be seem seem to be um, a tradition of quoting these two verses against heretics and pagans. And perhaps, as you said, it really has to do with origin himself. With origin himself, how interp he interpreted uh, Egypt allegorically, and the, um, the 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 twist, the the very uh, refined twist that that um, Paul Bararab gives to to this originian memory here is to translate it in Homeric terms. Yes, thank you very much. This is a very very interesting remark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, uh, Andy posted uh, a link, uh, the reference in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> so we have the reference. And uh, if there are no further questions or uh, remarks, I would like to thank you once again, our speaker today, Emilia Mifiori, for this great paper. And thank you, everybody, for joining and for contributing to the discussion. And see you next time. Thank you so much for the rich discussion. Guys, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> Bye, thank you. <laughs>